Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the ASU Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory event this morning on Women Leaders in Climate Action. I'm Amanda Ellis with the lab and so honored to be moderating today's panel. To tell you a little bit about the ASU Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Lab, you'll see with the signage number one in innovation in the United States, ahead of Stanford and MIT for the last nine years in a row, number one in sustainability, and in the top 10 for SDG, Sustainable Development Goal Impact, with the Times Higher Education rankings. So we're a very innovative lab committed to just and regenerative global futures grounded in Indigenous wisdoms and leveraging high tech. This morning, we have a wonderful lineup from the We Empower United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Challenge. And we are waiting for our third panelist who is still in line uh, through security. It's a very busy time here at COP28, as you can imagine. Yesterday was Gender Day, and we were delighted to see the range of events happening with the UN Global Compact and with a range of high-level UN speakers. The basic message is, without gender equality, we are not going to meet our climate targets. And we know that we are far from a level playing field as far as gender is concerned. We know, too, that we are far from being on track for our targets. Indeed, here at COP, indeed, the Secretary General has called Code Red for Humanity and is calling for either a breakthrough or the concern that we may have a breakdown. So critical to have women's voices in the mix. And we're absolutely thrilled to have with us two of our 2023 We Empower awardees. And I think both of these incredible women business leaders you will hear from are doing amazing work in the climate action space. So first of all, to introduce Andy Blair, who is the co-founder of Upflow from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and she is also the co-founder of Women in Geothermal and the immediate past president of the International Geothermal Association. Susan Blanchett. Oh, perfect timing. Elise Nelson, please join us. Susan Blanchett from Canada, who is a lawyer turned entrepreneur and the CEO and founder of Origin Air. This is an incredible invention leveraging super plants that actually have livers to process volatile organic compounds and reduce CO2 emissions. They're going to explain their amazing businesses. And in the middle, Elise Nelson, who is the CEO and president of Vital Voices Global Partnership. And Elise is our co-lead for the We Empower UN SDG Challenge and an absolutely terrific partner, has been involved in this space since she was an intern in the White House way back when, when Madeleine uh, Albright and Hillary Clinton actually co-founded Vital Voices. So Elise has been there from the very beginning and has an amazing story of deciding that she should really be at the Beijing Conference for Women. So she hopped on a plane, sat beside some African women, and uh, was a rather interesting standout uh, in the African women's dormitory. So you can see that Elise has been active in this space and very committed. She does everything it takes to make it work. So Andy, we'd like to start with you to tell us a little bit about your work as a scientist and a science communicator and why what you're doing in geothermal could be such a game changer for climate action. Kia ora. Thank you, uh, Amanda. Nā mahi nui kia koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, Andy Blair from Aotearoa, New Zealand, at the bottom of the earth down there in the South Pacific. Um, I'm going to talk to you, first of all, I'm going to talk and say um, the pitch that we did in New York, because it gives a really good summary of, of our businesses and, and what we believe in and, and what we're trying to do. So at Upflow, we want to inspire people to use STEAM 
to solve some of the world's most pressing problems. And by STEAM, I mean both the acronym for science, technology, engineering, arts and maths, but also superheated water vapor. Stand by, I'll explain that in a minute. So we're a research and innovation company that is in the geothermal energy sector. And what we want to do is build a bridge to take gifts from the earth to build a bridge between science and the real world. So we're solutioneers. We do the really complex, hard things to make science real. So to give you an example of the sort of projects that we're working on, we're, faced, we're looking at two big problems, climate change and hunger. We're working with a Māori group in New Zealand that owns geothermal assets. So Māori, the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, believe that we have to have more than economic outcomes. So social, cultural, environmental are just as important, if not more important, than economic outcomes. So we've sourced two microorganisms from their geothermal ecosystem. These bugs work together symbiotically to eat carbon dioxide and methane to make single cell protein. Yes, food. Right now for animals, but someday for humans. So, I'm not going to say that it's easy. Our experts scratch their heads all day, every day. It's really difficult, but we love it. So I've always been the translator in the middle between science, business, and community. I'm curious about people and about the world. I'm confident in the gray, like most of us women, that's where we have to operate. I'm okay with uncertainty and I'm, I'm okay with making mistakes because I think we all know that in order to do amazing things, we have to be prepared to make mistakes. But being wrong doesn't mean the end. Hearing no doesn't mean the end. It just means you have to find another way to work around it. So it's, it's really not easy to raise money for R&D. It's a really risky endeavor. Um, and however, the, the most cleverest solutions require the most brave people to try and solve them and be daring. And that's our sweet spot. That's our, the hard spot. And we love it. So we'll keep solutioneering and hopefully with support, we'll solve some of those world problems with STEAM, both kinds. Thank you so much, Andy. And you really encapsulate the aims of our founding benefactor, Julie Wrigley, when you talk about this bringing together of indigenous wisdoms and high tech to find solutions for the planet. And we know that methane is something like 85 times more potent than CO2 over a 10 to 20 year period. Shorter lived, but this is the decisive decade. We're really worried about that 1.5 degree threshold that scientists have been warning about. And it seems we're getting precipitously closer. So just fantastic to think about these bugs potentially consuming methane and then making a single cell plant protein that can be used for animal feed. And I'm thinking, well, mm, oh, that means we need less land to grow food for animals. I was absolutely amazed to learn that 90, 96% of animals on the planet are us, our domesticated animals, which is pretty shocking. Only 4% of wildlife left. So Andy, you're doing critically important work and we're very grateful. The other thing that you really sparked for me was science. Only 0.1% of the population are scientists, and unfortunately, many fewer women than men. And we know that when there's diversity, there's innovation. We had a very interesting presentation a couple of days ago, and there was a visual of a house key on a football field. And the physicist who was presenting said, that's how many scientists there are in the world, scientists and engineers, and that's a big part of our problem. So thank you for the amazing work you're doing. 
And I'm delighted now to turn to Susan, who is also harnessing science. And Susan, hopefully you're going to tell us your story too, so I'm not going to give away too much. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Blanchett, and I am from Canada. I'm going to start by telling the story that we told at the United Nations We Empower SDG Challenge, that I was the awardee, first Canadian, by the way. And Andy is the first New Zealander. <laughs> so as a teen, I read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And I was horrified that toxins in our environment accumulate in our bodies. I wanted to do something about it. So I became an environmental lawyer. And for 14 years, I held operators accountable for contaminated sites. Then at only 51, my father was diagnosed with early onset dementia. He was so healthy. He ran every day. He ate right. There was no family history no genetic markers. And because of my experience in contaminated sites, I did research. If it wasn't genetic, it had to be environmental. But how do you prove that? Air moves, it's difficult to measure. Eventually I decided if I couldn't litigate better air, I would learn how to clean it. So at Origin Air, we purify indoor air. We combine mechanical air purification with genetically modified super plants. These plants have a liver enzyme that has been proven to remove these volatile organic compounds or air toxins from the air we breathe. But we're just getting started. I know first, I love these plants because they never end up in a landfill where you find every other filter. But one thing that really bothers me is that we treat indoor air at the expense of our planet. So in buildings, facility managers pull in air, they heat it and cool it. And that's where the carbon footprint and the energy cost is born. But instead of recirculating this air, they just pump it in, heat it, cool it, and dump it out like a faucet running all day, every day. It's like a bathtub without a plug. And when COVID happened, those air exchanges doubled. And now the greenhouse gas footprint of buildings is 39% of our global GHG emissions. So my vision is a huge glass biosphere on the roof of a building. Combining our mechanical air purification with our super plants, we could recirculate 60 to 80% of the air in the building, resulting in a 40% greenhouse gas reduction and energy savings. At Origin Air, we call this our quadruple bottom line. People, planet, profits, and plants. Love that. Thank you so much, Susan. And this notion of if I couldn't litigate better air, well, I would just get on and help create it. Love that. And this this theme that we have through We Empower of women solutionaries is so exciting. I hadn't realized that, I'd never thought about it, filters going to landfill. So this is actually an amazing innovation. Now, I am going to ask Elise to speak next, but I want you to be thinking about how we can actually take this to scale. I'd, I'd love to know more about that. The image that Al Gore uses of us treating the, the skies like an open sewer really came to mind when you talked about what was happening with buildings. So I'm going to come back and, and ask you about that. Now, moving to Elise Nelson, who is our co-lead for the We Empower UN SDG Challenge. The challenge was launched in 2018 in the margins of the United Nations General Assembly. Actually, it was the only gender event that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, hosted that year for us in 2018. And the President of the World Bank at that time, Jim Kim, also spoke, along with the Council of Women World Leaders. So Elise and I feel that we had a very good beginning to the We Empower UN SDG Challenge. And every year, there are five awardees selected, one from each UN region, who are demonstrating an exceptional ability 
to meet and support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Challenge. And so we're delighted to have Andy and Susan with us this year, given that they are climate solutionaries here at COP telling their stories. Elise, Vital Voices does so many amazing things. Tell us a little bit about your work more generally in this space and some of the new initiatives that you have to really promote and support climate action for women. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And um, we've, I mean, you listen to these two women's stories and you just are like, wow, <laughs> you, it gives you hope. I think there's so many other conversations here this two weeks that are downers, right? I mean, it's like, whoa. But you listen to these women, the innovative ideas that they have, and truly, I have so much hope. So I think all of us know, we've heard the statistics about the disproportionate negative impact that climate has on women and girls. Did you know that after a climate crisis or disaster in a community, that domestic violence goes up by 300%? I mean, women and children are 14 times more likely to die in a climate disaster. So anyone who says, well, that's not true. It doesn't affect women differently. It absolutely does. Those are just two statistics. There are many, many more. But I think what gives us hope at Vital Voices is certainly these two women, but also the fact that when we're closer to the problem, we also come up with more innovative solutions, right? We're in a better position to solve these challenges. And I think we have absolutely seen that with the We Empower Fellows since 2018. It's a growing community of women who are truly solving these issues. And so I have lots of wonderful examples. But what I think this program has given us and what now research supports is that actually, Investing in women makes us far more climate resilient. And we have research now that proves that. That's a huge, huge step forward. So I think for all of us at Vital Voices, the work that we do is we are venture catalysts. We search the world for women who are taking on the world's greatest challenges. Yes, climate, but also gender-based violence, political transparency, economic development. AI and disinformation. And what we see increasingly is that climate is a thread through everything. I talked about the statistics earlier, right? Peace and security, huge. Political transparency, disinformation, all of it, right? Economic development, all the opportunities for green new jobs, right? And will women have a piece of that? Will women be scientists, right? How do we get more women into STEM? Um, so I think there's a real opportunity in terms of our work, and we're really doubling down on investing in women solutionaries and climate leaders um, all over the world. Thank you so much, Elise. I love this venture catalysts. Such a great vision. And so true that there has really been a plethora of research recently, women and girls, 80% of the victims of the climate crisis. But we do know now that more women on boards, more women in parliaments, and more women in positions of power as entrepreneurs makes a significant difference. So research, if you're interested, foreign policy, and also from the International Finance Corporation. We are delighted to be joined by a special guest, Prince Saeed of Jordan, who is the former High Commissioner of the Human Rights Council and did an absolutely outstanding job, is also a male ally. And I'm going to put you on the spot, Prince Saeed, and ask you to come forward, please, and just say a few words. Prince Saeed is married to one of the most powerful and amazing women on the planet who is doing incredible work globally on maternal mortality. And I, I will be seeing her in New York when we give the Climate Action Prize uh, to Fareed Zakaria, among others, on the 11th of December with the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents. And I know that Princess Sarah would expect you to come and speak and tell us why it is so important to have male allies, especially in the exemplary job that you did 
at the Human Rights Council to really uplift the voices of women and to protect women's human rights globally. So please come up and say a couple of words. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely unprepared for this. I received a text from Amanda and she said, let's have coffee. Come by the, <laughs> come by the, uh, come by the ASU pavilion and it'd be lovely to see you. And so, I, uh, <laughs> no, well, so I, I just, I just arrived and it's lovely to see uh, all of you here. I've always been a big fan of uh, Vital Voices and at least lovely to see you. And, um, you know, the, the human rights community is working, uh, or CEDAW in particular, is working on General Comment 40. I don't know how many of you are aware of the work that's taking place, but they want to revolutionize the way that we understand the presence of women. The presence is not enough, that we're going to evolve this into something beyond that and they're working on this idea of, of centering on leadership and it's not an it's not enough just to define a space but it's it, it has to be that space embroidered by dynamism and by an acceptance of the fact that the role of women in many respects is a leadership role and we have to pay homage to it and pay homage to it in law itself and I think it's going to be a, an enormous step forward in the way that we conceptualize it. And if we can conceptualize it in the context of climate, all the better. I, I just came from uh, a series of briefings from on, on all the separate issues um, and all the papers now presented. We're stuck on everything. Uh, there's no movement on anything that, uh, in the last 24 hours. The number of brackets, the text. Um, and so uh, this paralysis is almost the default, and we have to find the right threads by which to break it. Um, and it's very clear also that in so many pavilions and in so many um, of the meetings we go to, there are all forms of declarations and there are all forms of commitments. Um, we're now a little bit worried about there being too many, perhaps. And we don't know what's real from what's not real, what's really going to be funded from what isn't whether the funding is really going to materialize or not, whether there's a real campaign behind the funding. And um, in the Human Rights Council, we used to worry that when you had some really effective special rapporteurs, the member states, in, a way, in, in an effort to dilute their voices, would just create more positions. And suddenly, instead of having 20 effective, we had 35 and 40 and some not so effective. So we're keeping an eye on this space as well. But in breaking all the, the sort of paralysis that we may uh, encounter, the uh, attitude is not simply to make more declarations. The attitude is to really work ground up and use the leadership we find so evident at ground level, you know, especially First Nations groups from whom we can learn so much and then build it upward and make it change real. So I'm completely unprepared. And in my poor, my if my poor family, if they heard me speak, would just say, sit down. So, so, so thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you. It's so important to have male allies who actually understand the role of women. So thank you for the brilliant work you did at the Human Rights Council, and thank you for the wonderful work that you did behind the scenes on loss and damage, which was a breakthrough nobody expected at COP last year, and there were a number of people working behind the scenes to really make that happen. So thank you for that very important work. Now, the role of women leaders is critical, and segueing from Elise to Andy, Tell us a little bit about your role as co-founder of Women in Geothermal. And I love this whole notion of the wingman. So the importance of male allies there too. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, so uh, I was the co-founder of a group called Women in Geothermal Wing. Uh, we started in 2013 in Las Vegas, which I love because we left Las Vegas, you know, and the story, we told the story everywhere. Um, so it's our 10 year anniversary this year. Um, we are now three and a half thousand members strong in 86 countries. 
one of the key goals for us is to have 50% male membership. Um, we're currently at 33%. And the reason why, and the reason why I took over the role as the first, um, you know, one of the first people to build Wing was because I knew that we had to have men involved in that process that, you know, in the energy sector, I'm in geothermal energy and men dominate that space. And if we didn't have men in the conversation that helped empower our women, we were just going to sit in a circle and complain and nothing would change. So I think a key thing for us is, you know, men didn't create this problem. Society created this problem and we need all the genders to help pull us across the gap. And there's so much institutional bias in our everyday lives. We don't even ask the questions about why do we work from eight in the morning till 5 p.m. when that does not work for women with children or caring for families. Why do we do these things? Um, we never challenge them. And I think having men as allies, you know, they're in the positions of power and they can pull us across the gap. We have in um, we have a wingman. We call them our wingmen, and which is a funny connotation, right? About you know how men participate. We've done some training. We call them wingman, wingman special task force because men love a task force. <laughs> and what we've done is we built some training for men. When we started this, we were thinking, you know, let's look for some training to give because I was sick of hearing men ask me, "What can I do though? What can I do?" And I was like, "So many things." Um, and all the lectures out there are just about men do this and, and it was really formal and we want to be real and um, we want to show people and give them tools to actually do things. So we built a training session where we give men the tools to challenge and see the world differently, like through female lenses, things like how we exist in the world is different with respect to security. Like when we all came here, every single one of us thought about how are we going to keep ourselves safe as women? You know, men don't think about that like we do. And so we give this training and it opens their eyes. And it's quite hilarious because by the second, we, we do it over a few months. And by the second session, they're all like, why is this happening? And they become super uh, energized champions and we cannot tolerate this. And the, and the sad part of that for me is that we as women, you know, I'm like, why don't I feel so angry as they do right now and ready to act it's because we've just had a thousand million cuts over a million years and and we're just tired and and so to see these men stand up and participate is is just so heartening one of the we've seen actual change the world bank supported our deployment of wingman uh globally and we're doing the training in different regions we did an awesome training in el salvador um a couple of years ago we, we trained the trainers so we took a female and male teams and we they deployed them through Latin America and have we have wingmen there. And we see real change in those organizations, real cultural change. So you'll turn up in technical meetings and you'll see men say, whoa, 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 you spoke over here. What were you saying? Like really cool stuff that actually happens on the ground. And so I'm really proud of it. One of the um one of the moments where I was thinking, this you know, this could change. We might not be able to change the whole world, but we can change our world, the world that we work in and live in, and that hopefully will spread, um, was when I saw two young men who had been part of the training um, holding their senior manager to account, who was number two in the company, so at risk of their own careers, and saying, we do not do enough for women. Here's some policies. We've written a recruitment process. We want to do this in place. And I said nothing at that moment, which is unusual for me in the first place, but but I thought, you know what? Me as a woman watching that happen was just so emotional. And I thought things can be different. And also all of the women from that organization, I, I wish they could have been there and see these men champion them and want fairness. So so I'm really proud. It's a really proud awesome. um, part of the role that I do. So, so I could talk for everyone. So exciting. And that's part of the beauty of the We Empower competition too, that we're finding you amazing solutionaries, but you're not just working in your own businesses, you're working to scale and really creating a multiplier impact for change. Now, two things have really, little light bulbs have gone off for me. First of all, the World Bank has changed its mandate from being just eliminating poverty to eliminating poverty on a livable planet. 
So there is now a climate mandate. And second of all, so exciting to hear that the bank is supporting this work and they are also now publishing climate change development reports, which we are using with our parliamentary uh, work with the Interparliamentary Union. Very exciting. Thinking of women in science, we have a special guest with us today from the United States, Dr. Stella Kafka, who is the Executive Director and CEO of the American Meteorological Society. And Stella has agreed to just come and tell us a little bit about her experience as a woman in science and in climate science. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm another of those individuals who texted uh, Amanda, let's have some coffee and end up here. Uh, but uh, I would like to actually start um, my comments here just with something that Alice said, investing in women makes us more resilient and investments can start with science. It should start with science. I am Stella Kafka. I'm the executive director and CEO of the American Meteorological Society. And the reason why I joined the AMS is because the AMS has been committed to diversity and women issues since before DEI was an issue. We've had a committee of minorities and women since the 70s, so more than 50 years now. We have been elevating women's voices um, and uh, their status in science for all this time. And even now, 50 years later, we are running an equity assessment to even take a step back, critical step back, understand who we are, what we're doing, what we're not doing well, what we know, what we don't know, so that we can actually provide better seats on the table for women all over the world. I am the fifth CEO of the American Meteorological Society. I'm the first woman. And the AMS has actually 104 years of history, right? I'm the first woman and I'm the first immigrant. I was born and raised in Greece. So when the AMS engaged me, they really wanted change. And sometimes like, be, be careful what you're wishing for because you're gonna get it. Uh, so one of the focal areas and the focus of attention at the AMS is to actually make sure that women uh, have a, a, a spot, uh, they, they have a good seat on the table. Right now, about 60% of our council, which is our actually governing unit, is women. We have, we're have we making sure that women are represented in all kinds of nominations of awards, of scientific fellowships, of our higher honors. Uh, we make sure that women are being placed up front and center as role models. Younger individuals need to see those faces, need to hear those voices, need to understand that they can be it. And those individuals who have had a long history of fighting for a seat on the table need to actually uh, help uh, raise the, the younger individuals and cultivate the younger generation. Science is better when we all work together for it. And when diverse voices are actually working together, you produce outcomes like the ones that we heard here, uh, and you produce solutions. Uh, yes, climate is a, a global issue and it's a, a humanity issue, it's not a men or women issues, but only having 50% of the population working to find solutions is not fair for everybody. So uh, these are my remarks. Amanda, where's my coffee? Um, and I have one more thing to, to say, actually. It's really great being at COP and seeing the diverse faces and, and actually the beauty of the outcome of work of women here. It helps me feel part of a, a sisterhood, if not anything else. And yes, men are part of that as well. However, um, if you take a look at the family picture of COP, uh, where we have 140 world leaders who are speakers, only 15 are women. Uh, and actually, if you, if you look at party delegates that are here, about 38% of party representatives are women. So we can and we should do more. Um, exactly because we are part of the solution. We need to be part of the solution and we need to be part of the table where the conversations are happening. So with that, thank you so much for the opportunity and I look forward to following the conversation here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kafka. And uh, I'm going to segue straight on from that to ask Susan a little bit about 
her work because she's in a very male dominated field, both with the contracts you're trying to establish. So tell us a little bit about TELUS and some of those big contracts where you're already working, and perhaps also the trade mission that you've just been on to Thailand and to South Korea and some of the cultural dimensions there. Perfect. Thank you. I also want to just reiterate what you've said because it really takes being put up on a platform to have your story heard. And I, I, I saw a post this morning that hit home and it said from overlooked to overbooked. Oh, nice. uh, and I loved it because that's what organizations like Vital Voices and the sponsors from the Rockefeller Foundation and ASU Global Futures have done for us. They've, they've raised us onto a platform. Like you can walk into a room and be like, hey, I've got this great t technology and people will just turn away and walk away. But now we have a platform where we can express and a rubber stamp that says, listen to these women. What they're doing is really innovative. And uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a scientist. So if you want to get into STEM, you don't have to be a scientist. You just have to hire really smart people to work with you. <laughs> Right? Yeah, really smart woman to work with you. I have many um, female engineers that work with me, but I I came onto this just by reading an article about these genetically enhanced plants at the University of Washington and then negotiating the rights to those plants. And then when the other company that was male-led didn't pay one of their patents, I renegotiated and now I have global exclusive. So it's about jumping on those opportunities and having the platform to bring it to the world. Uh, so, yes, I was just in South Korea and Thailand on a trade mission sponsored by the government of Canada. And for my company that cleans air, it's very important to have all of these platforms because a lot of people in Canada still think we have the best air in the world and that we do not need this technology. They, I've been told it's a nice to have not a must have, but my response is we breathe 80,000 liters of air a day. Why is healthy air a nice to have? Like I want it to be a must have. And when I come to Dubai or South Korea to Seoul or to Bangkok, I don't have to explain why it's let's do it now. Right. So even in Vancouver, British Columbia, my pre-filters in a lead certified platinum building are pitch black in two months, all of them. So the time is now for us to not only think about the carbon in our air, but also cleaning the toxins that are causing disease and shortening our lifespans. Like I like to think that I am in the business of giving you a longer life. Mm -hmm. I love that. In the business of a longer life, but you're right. Why should we not think that clean air is a right? And we're seeing many young people now really hold us to account. And I wanted to welcome the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, Martin Chung-Gung, who has been a force in including young people in parliaments and also in promoting gender equality. Martin is the international chair of the gender champions across the entire United Nations system. And so we're so grateful to the work that Martin has been leading. He has also put in place some very good rules, and we would like to see other international bodies emulate those rules. So if you have a delegation that is all male to an interparliamentary union conference, guess what? You get less speaking time. So, Martin, we have emulated your lead. We have emulated your lead now with some work that we are doing with Blue Planet Alliance in Hawaii to promote 100% renewable energy. And we're delighted to have as partners to the Wrigley Global Futures Lab and our lab for uh, energy and power solutions. Hink Rogers, Blue Planet Alliance, and Mark Benioff from Salesforce bringing in delegations. And those delegations are the utility, a parliamentarian, and a community leader. And we've taken your lead, Martin, and there are no single gender delegations. So thank you for that very important leadership point. And we wondered, we have put your good friend, Prince Zaid, on the spot. We would love you to come forward 
and uh, say a few words about your important role as an ally, because we so appreciate your male allyship. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Great to see you all. And uh, I'm glad that we're uh, able to give some color to this panel. <laughs> yes, and uh, you, you've really put me on the spot because I, I have been preparing my notes for years now to make this uh, intervention. But uh, jokes aside, I think that uh, it's, it's a great thing that uh, when we are discussing climate action, we are also looking at it from the gender lens. It is very important that climate action is not gender blind. And uh, whatever field of endeavor we are involved in, we need to make sure that the views and rights of uh, both uh, sexes are at the table for uh, consideration. And that's why, Amanda, let me add to what you've said. We, our rules bite deeper than just people losing speaking time. They also lose votes. So, so if you come with a single gender delegation in the IPU, you instead of the three votes that you are entitled to in the council, the main decision-making body, you forfeit two. So you have just one vote. And so under people, it has been known to work because today we're talking of our assemblies uh, having something like 40% uh, uh, women whereas in the past it will be 20 and we'll be very happy about that. So, but we're moving to 50 because it's parity that we're looking at. And uh, again, when I talk to audiences such as this one, I hate to have to justify why we should be gender sensitive because uh, they don't ask men, you know, in leadership positions, what do you bring to the table? Yeah. Why would you ask women? I, so I just say that it is something that we have to do. It is justice. And when we're talking about climate justice, it cannot be climate justice if we're not also talking about gender justice. Both men and women have to be at the table, may have to articulate the views of all segments of society in an equal fashion. And that is why for us, representation is very important, making sure that women are represented. As you mentioned, I am chair of the Global Board of International Gender Champions. We're trying to break these ba gender barriers. And uh, we, I think there is a proposal now on the table that uh, there should be co presidencies of COP, which means that there should be one man, one woman all the time, and that there should be parity in the delegations coming to COP. So it is a proposal that is being move now. Uh, and of course, uh, again, as I said, I hate to justify uh, gender equality, why women should be at the table, but we do see that there is strong evidence that women are disproportionately affected by crises, whether it's political, and in this particular case, climate, the climate emergency. I just came from speaking with the president of the IPU, she's Tanzanian, and she cannot come to COP because her country is facing the worst floods, I think, in its history. And she, again, we're talking about the number of women and children who are being affected by this uh, natural disaster. So uh, I think it just makes sense that uh, we have everybody on board. We, we make sure that women are the drivers equally with men when it comes to action, to especially in the area of uh, climate uh, change. You mentioned something that uh, resonates very well with me, and that is let's go out and do it. Yeah. Let's stop justifying. We know that there are solutions that uh, have been tested. We just need the commitment. I saw out there people, uh, say, uh, I think uh, civil society saying, let's keep our promises. Go keep your promises. We know that there are lots of commitments out there. We just need to implement that. And you need political will. You need inclusive decision making where women are, and men are at the table taking decisions together for the uh, betterment of uh, humanity. So uh, I don't know, Amanda, if you expect anything, have I earned my keep? <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So appreciate it. <laughs> so just brilliant. Thank you, Martin. And we're so proud to be working with the Interparliamentary Union on the new campaign, My Parliament, My Planet, Our Shared Global Future. So uh, I see the head of comms in the audience too. Thank you for this wonderful work. And an opportunity, of course, parliamentarians are absolutely key to translating the nationally determined contributions into legislation, into bipartisan legislation, so that when government changes, we don't have anybody withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. So thank you so much for the important work you do. And I wanted to show my dandelion pin for Mary Robinson. We're very involved with She Changes Climate and the group that has been advocating for the 50-50. And Mary Robinson uh, has spearheaded this campaign. We are all dandelions. Dandelions are ubiquitous on each continent. And we dandelions spread very democratically. We want more and we want action. So this has been an absolutely terrific panel with two of my favorite male guests. Thank you for coming. And our wonderful male allies, so important to have. I'd like to ask each of the panel to say what is energizing you about the potential for COP and the engagement at the intersect of climate justice and gender justice, which, as Martin said, is so critical. So I'll start with Susan, Andy, and finish with Elise. I have to say this panel is energizing me to see this love fest of women and male alleys and everyone coming together in hope. This is what it's all about. And it just brings me joy. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for speaking and coming to watch us and tell about our innovations. Sorry. Yeah, I think if you could meet all the amazing women doing amazing, cool things that I've met, during COP and with Vital Voices and the team, um, I think you would feel the same hope for the future that I do. Um, we hear all the bad stats and the horrible things, but you know what? We're just going to get on and do it, and we're just going to get amongst it. And I think you can feel some optimism when you reach out and you say a few words to some of those women. You're like, damn, you are strong and powerful. We are strong and powerful. We don't need to listen to the rhetoric. Let's just get on and get it done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, so with the great support of Rockefeller Foundation, and it gives me incredible pride to be um, one of their partners, we brought a delegation, Vital Voices brought an extraordinary delegation of 14 women leaders, many of them. We empower fellows and honorees um, to COP really to be those voices of hope and progress. And if you stay for the next panel, you'll hear a few more of them. So I hope you'll do that. But, you know, we also joined with Foreign Policy um, and Daughters for Earth, a wonderful organization as well, to really look at um, the challenges, but also the real opportunity around uh, women's leadership uh, in climate. And I think all of us would agree, you know, we really are in this race against time. And it's not a situation where we can just invent our way out of it, this crisis. We also must protect our way out of it. I see Susan in the back there, and I know she's an incredible believer in nature-based solutions. And um, we released um, a report about the underinvestment in protecting, in safeguarding, um, and in biodiversity and the powers that actually our planet has to heal itself if we merely protect. Um, and so those are the two great underinvestments I see. And I think the hope is people are beginning to see that as well. Underinvestment in women, what is it? 0.2% of investment dollars in climate go to women's organizations? Sorry. But I think that's changing. Sorry, I was supposed to be hopeful. Anyway. Anyway, this doesn't give me hope. Yeah. She's very hopeful. Seeing Susan Craig, who has won the Sustainable Business of the Year Award and Restoring Nature twice. Thank you for being here with us today as well. And now with the Vilar Institute, training systems leadership for young people between 13 and 19 and already having a tremendous multiplier effect. So women leaders, we are really doing it. I want to thank the venture 
uh, catalysts at Vital Voices, Elise Nelson. I want to thank Susan, who has moved from being overlooked to overbooked. And I want to thank Andy, who is telling us we just need to get out and do it and have some optimism, everybody. Awesome. So get a photograph.
Thank you so much for being with us. Amanda, thank you for collaborating with us in this conversation. You're an important part of uh, fellowship we do with women public leaders from around the world, uh, namely politicians and policy shapers. The data tells us very interestingly that in countries that have more women in parliaments, their climate laws are better and more sustainable and more people-centered. So that is that is the, the one point that I really want to hone in on. And I want to talk to two wonderful women who will in a minute introduce themselves. But they are part of a political fellowship, Vital Voices kind of managers for women politicians from around the world. So Janice, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you come into the climate space with something that you are really passionate about. Thank you so much, Manira, and thank you all women for being here. This is my first COP, so I'm very excited. I'm a newbie and um, a very uh, newbie that is soaking up everything that is quite possible. And uh, yes, I'm part of Vital Voices, VVN Gage. And uh, for the last eight months or so, we've been exposed to some amazing training and networking opportunities. And as a politician, I believe that um, there's so much more that I can learn in order to be effective at what I do. So I sit in the Senate in Jamaica and I'm in opposition. So as an opposition senator, I do have the wonderful task of being as vociferous and, and critical as I would like to because it's not yet my responsibility to make it happen. However, one day I hope it will be. And that's why I'm part of what I'm um, here for today. The, the work that I do as an opposition spokesperson on tourism, it's an obvious connection with the climate and environmental issues. Because as an island state and dependent on tourism, a lot of our tourism development is along the coastline. And not only does that impact the environment and the water and everything else and, and, and waste management, but it also impacts communities and the people who are in those communities. So I have been advocating for the sustainable development of our tourism product to ensure that we have a tourism product for the future mm -hmm. because our economy depends on it. So it stands to reason that we would want to ensure that we have a sustainable plan in our development. And I have been calling for and ensuring that we not just build and allow for direct foreign direct investments, which we do need as part of our growing economy, but that we have responsible foreign direct and local investments in our product. So in addition, as a politician and being in um, the parliament and on the legislative side, we have to work with the business, private sector to make things a reality because it's all well and good to have wonderful ideas and great plans. If the legislative framework is not in place, then it cannot happen. And as a woman in parliament, who is part of, I am in opposition and eight of the five, four of the eight people on the opposition benches are women. On the, that's in the Senate and in the government side, four of 11 are women. In the lower house, four, four seems to be a common number, four on the opposition of 14 are women. And on the government side, 11 are women of 49. So in the lower house who are the political representatives who are um, elected, it's only 23%. But I must give credit to our Minister of Gender, who is Minister Grange, who has led and championed the work for a bicarmel um, group of parliament of women, because we recognize the importance of women being critical to the development of legislation in various sectors in order that we can have a more sustainable, forward-thinking country that is. So kudos. And so I'm very honored to be a part of that and even more honored to be here amongst all of you in order to learn and go back and continue my advocacy. 
You're part of the disruptors group, right? <laughs> Patricia, you're really at the intersection of youth, politics, and climate. It's, I think, one of the hottest spaces to be in. It's a space where we are seeing a lot of things happen. So tell us, how has the journey been? What are the challenges being a young person who doesn't want to be constantly told they're the future, but the present? And uh, how, how do you navigate this space? And tell us about the solution you're working on as well, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Patricia Zanella from Brazil. And I've been involved in politics since I was 19 years old. That was like last year. <laughs> I'm joking. It was in 16. So it has been more than nine years that I am working, building the Sustainability Network Party. Now we have the Environmental Minister Marina Silva in Brazil from our political party. Again, so we won the elections, and the first time that I ran to the Congress, I was 22 years old, and I was an activist for climate, and I, it was on the year that I became the first woman from South America, part of the Earth Advisory Council of the World Oceans Day. I was... <laughs> I, I studied international relations and I was studying a master's degree in international law. So I, I was navigating in this global governance world, but top, it was never my first option because I was working in the ground. I was facing the barriers to be a young woman in politics, facing the barriers to be an activist, to receive a funding, to keep going with the actions that I was involved in. For protect the oceans. Today, it's a really important day because the Women in Constitution Award and one of the organizations that I am a part of in, it was nominated in Transformational Change. So I am here on the COP also because of all my initiatives are being recognized. So it's a work of a lot of years. Even being young, I guess that what we bring to the table is the innovation and we are able to do the things quickly because we don't have nothing to lose when we are young. So we have more time, we have more energy, we just not have the funds, but otherwise it's working for it. So hmm. it's like seeing a dream come true because. When I know organizations like Vital Voices, I can visualize that I, I am able to continue in the ground, continue doing my great work because I have someone to support me. I will have the right connections. I will be able to build a network from zero, even coming to a periphery, to a background of a, a lot of barriers. So. For me, during all these years, the most difficult for sure, it was see a lot of incredible initiatives dying because the lack of funding. So I start to work more on it. I start to look for fellowships. When I became the first woman from South America in advisory council, I start to look other opportunities like this. I become the first woman from Brazil on the VV Gage Fellowship of Build Voice. <laughs> and I become a specialist in young woman in politics by the World Movement for Democracy as the first Brazilian woman also as a Hilford Gia Fellow. This pathway showed me that we need to do a lot of things, but if there's some space uh, there's another Brazilian involved. I can be the first and I can build all the pathway for more women attending. Teach them how to do it and teach them how can we do incredible things together. So for me, this is my plan for life. I, I work with sustainability and I have a dream that is ending with menstrual poverty because of this, I am working with biodegradable sanitary pets in Brazil. I have two partners and we 
all the patents of the first 100% biodegradable sanitary pets there. And I am here also clearly go to raise funds to build an industry and revolutionize the way that pets are made and distributed around the world to ending with menstrual poverty. Thank you so much. So based on what you said, Patricia, there are two points that I want to go a little deeper into in two parts. The first is that you have heard these voices and these are the voices that should be at COP, should be at every table, at every decision-making table. And yet there is this huge gap. Um, if we are unable to have raised some of the fantastic funding we did to be able to facilitate their journeys here, we would not have heard these these voices and these perspectives. So I believe uh, representation of women on country delegations is like between 30 and 35%. I mean, it peaks at that. And what is it that one has to do to change that number? Why is that number still so consistent and constant? And if you were to have come on your country delegation from Jamaica, Janice, what would you have had to do? And why does it seem impossible when it should be logical? Um, oh, that's, that's an interesting one. As I look out and I see um, Eleanor Jones, one of our champions in Jamaica, who has been at the forefront of environmental solutions and, and, and other people like Eleanor, who are the experts, they are the real experts in environmental issues and the climate. I'm a mere politician trying to understand and to make sure that I can be of value. Um, and be, to be a part of a country delegation, I understand and appreciate that I am not going to be a priority, but then my government Remember now I'm in opposition, but my government facilitated me being in this zone today. So I think the intention is there, but we have so many people who are part of the work that is underway in Jamaica in environmental matters. And so I can't say exactly what it would take, but what I do know is that across administrations, the one, th one of the areas that has been consistent is climate. The first time we had a minister of climate change, and it was sort of looked at in a funny way in Jamaica when it was announced minister of climate change. We're like, what is he going to do? But no, if we do not have such a minister, it would be like, how do we not? So we must, I must give kudos to successive governments for making sure that this is part of priority going forward. But from a political standpoint, I think in order for, we have to do more to get more women firstly involved in politics. And I, ha I have been involved in politics a lot, of, a long time, but we women tend to be comfortable, a little too comfortable in the background. But we have to go forward because in, the, in order for us to see the types of changes that we need to see, Women have to recognize that we have that responsibility and we have the capacity to be bold, do what needs to be done and step forward. I mentioned before the statistics of the women representation in both houses of parliament. We still have to do better, but I do not think as a whole, all of our countries are at the same place in terms of facilitating women to be involved in politics. Women are heads of households. We take care of family. We have the responsibility. It's not easy for a woman to be on the road, to be a politician. And it's, we have to be deliberate about wanting women to be involved. Because when women are involved in politics, we see the difference that it makes. We see the impact that it makes when women are in leadership in politics. And I would like to think that I will be a part of the change in Jamaica as it relates to our recognition for the importance of taking sustainable re action that's uh, sustainable in order to maintain or build or save the future that we are looking at. So yes, our delegation representation might be low, but I believe that the women who have been there, many women who have been involved in climate change and environmental um, advocacy, 
have been some very strong women who we must give kudos to. And our job leaving here must be to encourage more women to be involved because we know when women are involved, what that can lead to. And entities like Vital Voices or the Rockefeller Foundation help to facilitate that and give us our voice and make us recognize that we, we can do it. And it really is up to us to make that change. But she's here. So in my political party, we have quotas in all the position places of leadership. So for example, um, we have we needed to have 50% of women and men in our position. So if we have the communications direction, we need a director men and a director woman. So because of this, how the decision making process we have women mm -hmm. and this benefits us and benefit myself to become a candidate with 22 years old and this benefit also the distribution of resource to have campaigns more competitive by the way we are a small political party when we talk about the traditional political parties this does not happen so when we talk about the legislation changing with quotas, we are talking about it because we need to guarantee a space on the decision making process for women. It's not just about guarantee the seats in the ending of the day. It's guaranteed that all the process it will be built equally with women, defining the financial, defining the flags, defining the proposals. By the same time, having men seeing that this really have difference on the end of the day. So we have a lot of work to do. In Brazil, we have less than 15% of women like this. I am in a small political party, but I am sure that when we are able to share this kind of innovation, decision-making process, we are able to build in pathways that will be equal and that will provide us a way to rethink the way that the things are built and structured to guarantee gender equality. Patricia, what did your country delegation look like in terms of... Okay, so uh, Brazil have a huge delegation in COP. We have more than 1,000 people working in the COP. So it's not people, I guess that when we are talking about the um, representation in this delegation, we have such amazing NGOs that are doing a great work to bring indigenous people, black women, young women, young people to the table. So Importantly, now that we we are in the government, the things are going better. So the last COP and the Egypt, the things go really, really bad because if anyone was able to really guarantee a credential to the COP, so everyone that attends the COP in the last year, it was because they have connections abroad to provide the credential. So these years were different. So we have this credential that is party overflow that was provided for the civil society connected to NGOs. So it was a transparency process and a democratic process that allowed you independent, um, your position, your class, your gender to be here. I just want to acknowledge today is uh, the day of the indigenous people and climate intersection. Mm -hmm. And um, really wanting to know how you have been involved in this space and, and the work you're doing, especially the younger generation, if you could okay. share with us. So in Brazil, we are working with indigenous community doing sanitary pets to provide them affordable and subsistence of pets and to generate income for indigenous women. So for me, it's really important to have this work in the ground. When we talk about Brazil, we are talking about his country and be able to do this work, to be work close to organizations that are doing this work, not just in Brazil, but around the globe for me means a lot. So yes. 
Absolutely. Janice, would you like to share something about work with marginalized and indigenous people? Well, indigenous, I haven't worked directly with indigenous people, but I will speak about women and within tourism. Um, in our country, tourism um, is a major employer and the majority of the people who are employed in tourism are women and they are women who are single women who head up households and a significant percentage of those women are low paying low paying jobs that they are in so my advocacy and the work that I do is to bring attention to the importance of ensuring that there is security of tenure in their employment a number of those levels of those who are employed are typically employed on contractual basis, and that presents a challenge for their own families because without the security of, in, of a long-term engagement, then it, it is going to impact what it is that you can plan to do and be able to do. And so I know that we have to move in the direction of ensuring that People are employed in a more um, permanent basis and be provided with uh, benefits for them and their children, their families, because that is part of sustainability. Mm -hmm. The sustainability in terms of being able to maintain families so that they can see tourism not just as a job, but as a way to transform their lives. Because too often, tourism tends to be seen as an extractive industry and one that tends to be for mainly for those who are the big investors, who are the ones who are investing in. And I must say that there are a number of large investors who do great work in ensuring that they provide fair and equitable treatment of their workers. But we still do have a way to go to ensure that it is a standard that's across the board. And as an opposition spokesperson on tourism, these are some of the areas that I try to focus on because when we do take care of the women who are the backbone of the industry, then that is a way to, to ensure the survivability of the said industry. So the entire sustainability issue is environmental matters. Mm -hmm. It is um, people and their employment and how they're treated and the fair treatment. And there has been a lot of progress made for workers in the industry, but we still have a ways to go because um, we do end up right now with a, a massive um, migration issue in Jamaica in terms of workers going elsewhere to find jobs that are able to pay them in a more, um, a more a better livable wage. And so in order that we do not continue to erode not just our communities, but also families, we have to pay attention to how we re, um, pay people and provide them with the benefits for them to re remain in Jamaica. Janice, I'm curious. We know that island nations are really in crisis, right, in terms of, of climate change and things like that, and, and countries that are so dependent on tourism. How are you all approaching this this whole space in terms of a little futures thinking and, you know, how, how do you plan for a future that is so uncertain in these spaces? You know, um, if you're not careful, you could be daunted by what the future looks like. And as we were talking about in the other panel, we we have to know that it can be done and will be done. And progress has been made. We had recently the introduction of a pension scheme for tourism workers as one way of ensuring that at the end of the day, after making so much investment of time and effort on your part, that their government has put in place a pension for um, workers, for both the employer and the employee to contribute to. But from an environmental standpoint, we have to do the studies to ensure that the how we allow for the investment and the build out of the industry is not one sided. We have seen a massive increase in investments of very large properties, large properties that come with large challenges. And a lot of times we that results in based on the nature of the type of um, product that it is, which is the all inclusive product. 
we have the potential for visitors to the country to really only have a, a sort of a one-sided experience. My work and what I want to see is a wider, more diverse type of investment that allows for communities to better benefit from tourism by ensuring that with the hotel investments, there's the possibility of the other areas in the community to benefit, whether it is in transportation, whether it is entertainment, um, whether it is in um, shopping and restaurants. We do have that, but we need more of that because we want to ensure that more of the money remains in the community, in the, in the economy. Right now in Jamaica, out of every dollar that is spent, in, that's calculated, roughly somewhere about 37 to 41 cents of the dollar is what remains in Jamaica. And that's insufficient. Yeah. In order to have a sustainable economy and a sustainable industry, we have to grow that number to in excess, I would say, of like 60 cents in, for neighboring countries like the Do Dominican Republic that has just about 60 cents of their dollar retained in, in the country. We must move it from where it is right now because Otherwise, it will continue to be seen as an extractive industry sure. that does not provide sufficiently. It provides, but we want it to provide more. Got it. I, I'd love to open uh, the panel out if you all have questions, any comments, any suggestions, any solutions as well. Amanda. Come here. Amanda here. This is your spot. I wanted to say congratulations on a terrific program and just absolutely delighted to be a teeny weeny little part Big of it. Fun. So thank you, Manira. Big fun. And just <laughs> incredible to hear the work that you women are doing. So I have an offer to make that I just got approval from Elise to announce is that I'm on the board of the Blue Planet Alliance, which is funded by Hank Rogers and Mark Benioff of Salesforce to bring delegations from countries who are prepared to sign up to 100% renewable energy by 2045. So wouldn't it be amazing? And they have promised me there will be no all male delegations. We will have a woman youth or youth community link. So it really struck me when you talked about your role in the intersect in Brazil. And of course, with Jamaica, with islands, Hawaii is the first state in the United States to declare 100% renewable energy. And at the time it was raised, the governor said to Hank, well, that's just like Harry Potter thinking. And when they engaged youth and youth drew pictures, gave them to their legislators and said, here's our vision for the world we want by 2045. And to get there, we need 100% renewable energy. It passed the legislature unanimously. And we've gone from being 5% renewable to 40% renewable in the space of just a few years. And we've saved a ton of money along the way. So the offer is there, Manira, to you yeah. running the program. And 40 women politicians. <laughs> so let's in about think about five countries. how so. we can do that. So there are two cohorts a year who come to Hawaii. And we would like a politician. We would like, wouldn't it be fantastic? We had all women politicians. We had a politician. We want a community leader and ideally the head of the utility Got so it. that the commitment can be made before. And then it is a really fantastic program. I participated this year and many of those who came, including the Speaker of the House of Tonga, the head of the utility in Samoa, said it was the best program they'd been on. And because you're bringing community leaders, politicians, and the practitioners together. So we would love to partner with Vital Voices to make that a reality. So perhaps Jamaica uh, might like to come. You know, I was about <laughs> to say that my minister, unfortunately, he's a male, but our minister of environment, who is a very, um, he, I would think he's a feminist. Um, he, he certainly would want to encourage something like this because the reality is that Jamaica is seeking to move to reducing the dependence on, and we have done work already and continue to do work in terms of LNG. And now we've been having discussions about nuclear energy. So I think this is something that Jamaica would want to participate in or seek to participate in. Um, or, or, um, and our energy partner, of course, might come kicking and screaming, 
But um, certainly, I think this is a very um, noble effort and something that many countries, Jamaica included, will want to participate in. Very exciting. And I think the thing that's wonderful is that the utility can be shown how they can make more money, saves money for customers, because, of course, renewables are so much cheaper, two to three cents a kilowatt hour versus 50 to 60 cents for fossil fuels. So, in fact, as long as things are structured and you can learn from all the mistakes that Hawaii made along the way, now over 50% of all Americans are covered by a pledge to 100% renewable energy as a result of Hawaii's leadership. So, this is exciting. Thank you. We have a, a partnership through the our uh, ASU Leaps and Global Futures with Vital Voices and Blue Planet Alliance. You heard it first here. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, fabulous. So before we round up, one last question, which is, um, where do you feel the investment needs to happen for us to see progress slightly faster than we have seen it in the gender and climate space? Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah. Um, well, I will tell you that as a politician, I would like to see, I think that we have to find a way to have more women involved in politics. We have to invest in and put our money where our mouth is as because we have talked a lot about um, investment in climate change and renewables. I believe in, if I use tourism as an example in Jamaica, small properties that are struggling with the cost of energy in order for them to be profitable and remain in the sector. And a lot of the small properties are actually run by women. In, it's for those who know Jamaica, for example, in Negril, a lot of the small properties are managed by women. We have to ensure that the small property is sustained. And in doing that, we have to invest in them being able to access cheaper energy because it is probably the most expensive input in their business in tourism right now. So you're saying the investment should be in non-renewable, I mean, in renewable, sorry, in renewable energy right now. That's, yes. that's where you believe the class should be. Yes. And, um, and secondly, I would say that in terms of, in order for anything to happen, like I said before, it is great to have wonderful ideas, but then the implementation does require the legislative framework. And too often women want to be involved in politics, but they cannot afford to be involved in politics. So how do we facilitate women to recognize that they can be supported in their efforts to be involved in a process? We do have a good representation in the Senate, and we need to do better in the at both at the local level and the national level in terms of representation, not enough women are seeing it possible for them to step forward. So oh, how... So could it also be more groups of women holding their politicians accountable? That's mm -hmm. the other way of looking at it also. That's right? another way of looking so at it. So basically more women in the process. In the process, yes. Got yeah. it. Okay. Patricia. So I will answer and three different areas i saw that the first one is to reduce inequalities mm -hmm. so we need to provide the basics i work with menstrual poverty because of it if we are not able to guarantee menstrual dignity how can i talk about the woman being an, in any kind of decision making process how can I talk about with a woman that is suffering with hunger, that is with cold, to be in a decision-making process? So we need to talk about the basic things first. So generate income for women initiatives that are thinking about how to enter women in the labor market, how to provide better jobs opportunity, how to provide financial investment, money, funds in the hands of women. This is the first thing for me. The second one is about education because we suffer a lot when we wish to be in a decision-making process. But when more we study, more barriers we will find with men that are not allowed us or not, are not 
happy with our leadership. So we need education and network to understand that we are suffering a lot of barriers because of gender. It's not because we are stupid or not good enough. It's just because of gender or racism. So we need to work with education in this process. And specifically about climate, uh, I am on the field of WASH. So I believe that we have a lot of women that already have initiatives uh, aligned to WASH, to water, to sanitation. And we need to provide more access to funding to these initiatives being able to increase and be a real solution all around the globe. We already have the solution. Probably the solution came from a woman. <laughs> so we just need aligned investment with the right people and make it happen. We already have the solution. I guess that we, we need to keep this in mind. We don't need to create nothing from zero. Probably we just need to find the woman that already solved this issue. Thank you. So a little bit of a lot of money in the hands of women. And the thing that I think is also really important for us to make our case is data, 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 right? What is it that we know intuitively that we need to put into data and then we need to walk in and say, this is what the data says and this is why it makes sense to invest in women, in their solutions, in their leadership, in everything that they just do so casually. So thank you so much for being with us. Yeah.